five, four, three, two, one. What's going on, everybody? Nicholas Ayers here. Uh, we got a number of folks uh, who have joined and who will continue to join. Uh, I'm Nicholas Ayers. He is Adam. I'm going to let him say the last name. Adam Serwinski, guys, out of Chicago, Illinois. Say it again, Adam. Adam Serwinski, just like it's spelled. Super easy. <laughs> and we are here with Steve Hawley from Roanoke, Virginia. What's going on, Steve? Not much. Just ready to get to it. Yeah. Sounds so, good. Sounds good. So we, uh, we wanted you to be our first participant on the podcast because there's a pretty interesting storyline here. You were the very first ever IAOA member in the group. Before it was even called IAOA, before it was anything – there was Steve Hawley in Roanoke, Virginia. That's like that's something you should put on your wall. Well, you know, it just shows that Captain Dave was making good choices early on. That's that's how we got to where we are now. Right, for sure, for sure. So tell us what's going on in your neck of the world. In your neck of the woods, what's new? What's happening? Talk to uh, me. I was telling you earlier. I have uh, paint on my hands. I'm uh, trying to make a green screen here, learning some video. Uh, you know, all kind of neat stuff here. So I came back from. Orlando, ready to get after it. What kind of uh, what kind of video are you trying to shoot first? Well, I'm in a uh, blog competition right now, and I'm taking on Joshua Lipstone. A blog competition? Oh yeah. Tell us yeah. more. I'm with uh, Chris Langell, Advisor Evolved. So uh, he set up a little uh, sort of like the NCAA tournament bracket situation, and I won my first round matchup uh, against Ed Cooper. Good. Good competition there, and uh, now I've got to take on the king, Joshua Lipstone. Uh, so next week, he and I will be rolling out blogs, and there will be video in it. So, well, well Josh, is. Josh isn't even in the podcast right now, so I'm going to go out. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I hope you just dominate him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's been some uh, discussion between us, some uh, Ric Flair woo videos going back and forth. So it, it's going to get intense. You can never go wrong with a good Ric Flair video. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. So uh, just really quick, Steve, let's just, I'm going to hop through. We're going to do something just so everyone kind of gets to know you a little bit. I think Nick has a little background. We've caught up a couple of times. Um, just want to come through, we'll do the fast five, and then we'll kind of walk through some things if, with Nick and us in a real conversational way to kind of loosen things up, but get people to know who Steve is. How it sound good? Sounds great. Fantastic. The point of these questions is to answer them very, as quickly as possible and try not to think. Okay. Right. So here we go. First one, married or single? Married. All right, kids. Two kids. kids. Two kids. Uh, names and ages. Uh, Greg's twenty-two. Julia is fifteen. All right, fantastic. Favorite color? Uh, blue. Blue. I like it already. And favorite sports team? Mets. All right, and fa and last one. Go to karaoke song. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't have one. Were you don't serious? Care. Okay, the shower care. song. What's that? Like the song you belt out in the shower that you think you could probably pull off if you were in America's Got Talent. You know, I'm kind of low-key. I'd say right now it'd be uh, something by Jason Isbell. Isbell. All right. Very cool. So why don't, one of the things we wanted to really focus on, this is practical, pragmatic stuff. Nick and I love hearing stories about insurance agents. How did you get your start in insurance? Uh, you know, I, I kind of lucked into it. I had a buddy that was in the business. Um, I was young, married, uh, new baby on uh, well actually already had the new baby before i started in insurance got into the life and health business with him starved to death while i learned how to sell insurance um then eventually uh moved out of that into the pnc side got in with uh, a state farm agency uh kind of learned the ropes there then went into uh the employee side with state farm actually ran an agency for them and got ready to go into the agency side until uh, they told me that I was going to have to move to do that. I just built a home, loved the area that I live in, didn't want to move, and uh, so started looking the independent route, and that's how I got started in the agency. Very cool, very cool. And, and so when you say you, start, you started off, so what, tell me about your first insurance sale on the PNC side or health side, whichever is interesting. Yeah, it's been a, it, I was doing Medicare supplement and long-term care type stuff. So I could just about guarantee it was a, a Medicare supplement. Um, but, uh, you know, that's been so long ago. I couldn't tell you who, what, any of that. <laughs> Very cool. 
Very cool. So why don't you tell me things about what's what's the strength of your agency? What would you say right now is, is the things that your agency does better than better than others or, or is really kind of cooking on? Well, one of the things that we try to do that's maybe a little bit different than most is uh, I'm sort of a numbers nerd. So, uh, you know, if I could put it in a spreadsheet and dice it up, that's that's what I try to do. Um, we kind of have developed over the years a tool we just call it our production log. Basically, I can't find an agency management system that gives me the numbers that I want for my new business production. Um, we see people talking about pipeline tracking and you know where your leads are coming from and this, that, and the other. So I just kind of, over the years, have developed a spreadsheet. Um, and so we, we really do a pretty good job, I think, of closely tracking where our business is coming from, closing percentages, you know, how different things that we do affect those sort of things. So I would really say that's probably one of the strengths that we have. Yeah, you know, Steve, I've actually seen, we actually utilize your same production log in our agency. Right. Uh, you sent it over to us. We made a few tweaks to kind of individualize it for our agency. And it is, a, I got to say, it's a beast. Um, it really does. I, mean, I, I think you need a, probably a, a PhD in mathematics to, to probably figure out some of the Excel formulas, but uh, they're already there. It's, it's really fantastic. We have it broken down for each producer. We have it broken down for each line of, uh, of business. Uh, we see it all. It, does, it is far superior to what we utilize for our management system for reporting. It's, it's actually really, really sharp. I got to commend you on that. Yeah, and I can't take a lot of credit for it. I mean, I'll tell you, I spent 300 bucks and got a consultant and to build, you know, sort of the basics. So all those formulas and that sort of thing. I went to a guy, uh, found him online, MrExcel.com, uh, if he's still in business. Uh, he's the one that's responsible for a lot of that sort of thing. And like I say, I invested 300 bucks in it, and I've made that money back hmm. you know, numerous times. Awesome. Very cool. And, and so what metrics are you looking at? Like what, what do you, if, you have, if you're looking at your headings, what, which are the big numbers that you, that you drive on? Well, you know, we've got uh, – of course, we look at our closing ratio. I've got it broken down. Uh, we have two locations, so I have it broken down by location and by a staff member, uh, the producer. Um, we have a uh, tab for each producer for their pipeline, so we can kind of see everything and where it's at in the sales process, you know, uh, through the funnel and that sort of thing, and then another tab for the agency as a whole. And what that's kind of allowed me to do is sort of forecast sales, you know, next month. So I could kind of see that our closing ratio, you know, stays around, you know, we're inching up around 60% now, you know, on average. So if I can look at my funnel and see we've got X amount of number, you know, in the funnel, then probably next month we've got, if we don't do anything else, 60% of that that we're going to write. Um, you know, then we track it by carrier, by line of business, by lead source, what we're writing, uh, what's in the funnel, that sort of thing. The lead source is, is a huge one for us, um, you know, because everybody wants to measure their ROI when they try something marketing wise. And quite honestly, you know, until we really started putting every piece of business into some sort of spreadsheet, we did not have a good grasp on exactly what our ROI was from, from any sort of marketing. That we did. So, um, you know, I check that. I've got a regular process, you know, once a month that there's certain reports that we pull and certain numbers that I want to. Uh, you know, kind of track. And uh, a lot of that comes from our production uh, log. Steve, what, uh, what are you doing right now from a marketing standpoint to fill that production log with new leads? What, what are some of the things that you're doing or have done that you found success in, uh, in your local market? I'm kind of baby stepping right now into some Facebook ads. And I would love to have any sort of input from anybody else in the group that uh, is really good at Facebook ads. Um, we built a landing page specific for contractors in Virginia. Um, Erie Insurance is our main carrier, and uh, they do a really good job for small contractors, small to mid-sized contractors. So we built that out. Uh, we ran a little bit of uh, money behind it. I think I spent 300 bucks or something this month. Uh, we've gotten some leads from it. We've written a little bit of business. It's probably still a little too early to tell if it was a success or not. But I'm kind of trying to do bursts like that and really driving more online. Um, we're finding in our numbers, we're finding that we actually close a fair percentage of the, the leads that we get through our website. So our closing ratio is better on those. I kind of think it's sort of where the market's going on those. So uh, that's one of the things that we're doing right now. But really, the most success that we have is probably like everybody else. We've got a referral program um, that it's going to probably account for 25% of what we do this year. 
Um, and then we're taking a more proactive approach about cross-selling, you know, sort of writing, you know, finding the, the diamonds at your feet, you know, type of deal. Um, and I've got a program in place for my staff, my service staff, um, for the, it, it's a AM PM is what we call it. I want them once in the morning and once in the afternoon to ask somebody else, you know, somebody that's a client of ours on a service call, if we can, you know, look at another line of business for them. So they call us for an auto change and we don't have their home in the morning. You know, that staff person says, Hey, why do we not have your home? Is that something you'd mind us looking at? They say yes, no, whatever. I don't care. They just write it down and, and we have a calendar on their desk and each day they'll say their AM was this person, their PM was that person. And, um, it's something simple. It's easy to track. And, uh, I can't take credit for it. Kelly at uh, Agency Performance Partners uh, is the one that kind of put us onto that, but it has uh, really helped uh, up our cross sale. Interesting. Gotcha. Uh, we have somebody who's asking, Carlos Vargas is asking if the production log is something that you would be willing to share uh, with others. Is that something yeah. that you would? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can put it on the Facebook page if, if that would help. So. Okay. Carlos just gave you a big thumbs up. All right, so Carlos. Feel good, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Back That's at you. <laughs> fantastic. So you talked a little bit about the Facebook stuff and the marketing things that you're doing and these AM, PM things. What, it's always kind of, we all have kind of had things that we've thought, maybe you haven't, but I have, have had things that I thought would set the world on fire marketing less. Give us like an idea of maybe your biggest flame out, like the one thing you thought, my goodness, this is it. I'm going to unlock the path to ensuring the world. And then you come back and it goes, meh, like no one really cares. <laughs> yeah, right? we, we did a, you know, everybody's trying to find their niche or whatever. Uh, probably mine, well, it would definitely be mine, was uh, we were going to set the world on fire for golf courses. I love to play golf. Um, and it was like natural. Yeah, I'm going to sell insurance and, you know, go to golf courses all around the state. It's going to be beautiful. Got a nice database. We took a lot of time to you know, put information in. We did mailers. We did, you know, all of this kind of stuff and got zero. I mean, well, I write my local course. Um, and uh, I think we have, we have one other golf course besides that. But, uh, you know, it was we, – we built out a separate web page for it. We bought URLs. We did the whole thing and nothing. How long, how long did you devote to that niche? Uh, that was probably a seven month process. At what, at what point did you say this is going absolutely nowhere? <laughs> well, I, I pretty much, you know, in the first three months or so, you're like, okay, it's just taking a while. And then uh, after that, it's like, no, it's not just taking a while. We're just not good at this. So I'm not saying I won't go back to it at some point because I would love to write a ton of golf courses and just go around and visit them and play golf and that sort of thing. But uh, probably the probably the piece of advice it should have been instead of going there to play golf, maybe you should have went and talked to like somebody in management. Yeah, yeah, that might that you might have helped. You can't yeah. just show up in your Holly Insurance T-shirt. <laughs> Well, I thought sitting at the bar, you know, I put in my time. There's no doubt. I put in my time on the course sitting, and at the bar. I'm sitting at, I'm sitting at the bar. I'm playing golf and nobody's right, talking to me. My shirt. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm here. We've got a website. See, uh, you got to be careful about rebating, though. You don't want to get in there and spend, you know, kicking money back the whole time. That's true. <laughs> don't be worried about your premiums going back to them. No, that's super exciting. That's awesome. That's uh, that's great to share. Now, uh, you said you talked earlier about the agency and, and some of the things you're doing to grow your agency. What types of things maybe do you think you're doing? And we talked a little about the numbers, but when you're managing an agency, what do you think people, what do you wish you would have known before starting your own agency um, in, in, in the management side that maybe agents would benefit from who are listening today? Probably one of the big things that switched for me, you know, I've, I've gotten out of the sales side now. Um, I really don't do any sort of personal line sales. Uh, most of what I'm into is on the sales side would be larger commercial accounts or something that just the rest of my staff wouldn't necessarily be comfortable with. I'm sort of like Grant, you know, he said, if somebody needed homeowner's insurance, he's the least qualified person in his agency to, to sell it to him. I'm that guy in my agency. I'm, I'm, I'm the least qualified guy, but sort of the thing that turned the switch on that was a, a old Erie agent buddy of mine that uh, he sold his agency and now does consulting is Joe Hagan. And um, he had just sort of a, a, such a different mindset on, he ran his agency as a business as opposed to uh, as a salesman. And, uh, you know, I, I took a course that, that he did, uh, read the E-Myth book, uh, Michael Gerber, if anybody's not read that, uh, and really took it to heart. So uh, now I really try to work on more high leverage things and things that my staff can't do. 
you know, things that, that, uh, you know, I need to be working on that only I can do uh, as opposed to, you know, doing day-to-day -day sales stuff. And I found that number one, I wasn't as good at the things that I was doing previously as I thought I was because my staff do it better anyway. Um, but it really helped my agency grow when I was able to kind of take a step back uh, from, from being the, the quarterback and, and now moving to being the coach. You, you mentioned, uh, you, you kind of touched on something real briefly, and I just kind of want to get your thoughts on, on something in particular, because I, I hear two schools of thought in this area sometimes. Uh, you mentioned that unless it's a large commercial account, you're more than likely not writing the business. Um, well, no, we'll write it. I'm just personally not. You, right. You, you personally, you're not, you're not doing that. Uh, now, what would you do or what advice would you give other agents that maybe we see it in the group constantly, people constantly churning out questions and looking for advice on where to place markets. At what point would you say is a good jumping off point for agency owners that if they're, if they're wanting to get more on the working on their business type thing versus working in it, where would you say people should really start to tip that scale and, and what advice would you give them in that regard? I really think it's, it's individual, you know, um, I, th I think, I had this conversation with a group of agents recently. You know, I think our businesses are kind of different than most. You know, our, a business, I think, kind of exists to serve the stockholders. Well, I'm the only stockholder. So the business needs to serve my needs, whether that's financial or what I enjoy doing or whatever. If you're the guy that really enjoys being in the trenches and really enjoys making those sales and that sort of thing, maybe you never get out of it because your business – but do you think that, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I just kind of want to add to my question a little bit. Do you think that if you're somebody who aspires to have a large agency, that you can ever get to that point if you're constantly someone who's in the trenches? Or do you think you need to be more someone who's leading, uh, you know, and, and telling other, you know, and working on a sales force to do that for you? Do you think you yeah. can ever really grow to a large agency i'm asking you i'm not i don't have an opinion one way or the other. yeah i i think it would be very difficult i don't see how you grow to to be a a very large agency doing it all yourself i mean it's sort of like you know you only have so many hours in a day so if you you personally have to be responsible for you know doing the e-sign or or the you know wet signatures or whatever's got to be done you on, you're going to run out of time in a day uh, now if you're doing large enough accounts and you know you you can do those all day long, then God bless you and, and do it. But uh, I'd say for most agencies, if they want to get large, they're probably going to have to start turning those things over. And when, you know, when you start seeing things, you're doing things that you know you could pay somebody else 10 bucks an hour to do, that's probably the time to get out of it. You know, it, it, you can't do it the first year. There's no way you can do it. You know, or unless you just, your growth takes off tremendously, but you know, starting out, it takes a little while to, to do it, but you know, you have to look at your business as a business, even when you're one person and you say, okay, does it make sense to pay my rate for, you know, this work to be done for the phone to be answered, to be taking payments to be, you know, whatever the deal is, or would any other business want to pay somebody $10 an hour and then pay me to go out and sell? Right. Um, yeah, I think that's just kind of the logic that you have to use and it's going to be different for everybody. But, um, you know, it, when you start seeing those types of things coming across your desk on a regular basis, maybe it's time to, to look for somebody. Carlos uh, asked a question. He wants to know, just so that people who are listening can understand and, and have an idea, how many, uh, what, what does your agency staff look like? How many, how, how, how big is your staff? What is the breakdown between sales and service locations? Give us kind of the breakdown uh, on, on your team. Well, there's five of us now. Um, so, and everybody is licensed except my wife. She doesn't work in the agency full time. Uh, she uh, does our inspections and that sort of thing. She's a full time real estate appraiser. Um, so she, that's, that's her business, but she does all of that kind of stuff and will pick up some slack for us. And there's myself and I have three other staff people. Two are at this location and the other, uh, this is actually my Boone's Mill office. And then the Roanoke office, uh, I have one producer um, there and it's basically just a sales office. It's not your typical main street, uh, you know, people walking in, making payments, that sort of thing. It's, it's, it exists for Scott and myself. Uh, to kind of go back and forth. What's the geographic distance between the two, two locations? Uh, about uh, 20 miles. Um, it, my agency, where I am now, is in a town of 250 people. I mean, literally there are 250 people in Boone's Mill. Uh, Roanoke is sort of the city 
in Southwest Virginia. Uh, for any folks, I know Graham was saying that he had folks in this area, but um, you know, this is Roanoke, sort of the the geographic uh, city for uh, all of Southwest Virginia. So it was important for me to get there. I purchased an agency there. That's why we have the office there now. And uh, Scott more or less does the day-to-day -day sales. Um, and then I'm there, you know, maybe two days a week. Hmm. Very cool. Wow. So Steve, we talked a little bit about your management. We talked about your size of agency. When you, when you were deciding on how to grow out or how to scale it for yourself, what, and you said you're a numbers guy, what numbers drove your decision making, right? So you told us you look at specific numbers on your pipeline, we talked about size. Did you have any specific indicators that maybe the rest of us could look at and say, this is when you know, and I know you talked about, you know, hourly number stuff, but was there anything you saw in the numbers that you created that was basically a trigger to you? As far as, well, one of the biggest numbers, and, and when you talk about expanding the agency and, and trying to get bigger and that sort of thing, uh, we're not where I want to be yet. And as a matter of fact, I'm you know, working on uh, perhaps another uh, purchase uh, soon. And if we do, we may end up with another location and that sort of thing. But from a numbers standpoint, you know, I kind of feel like a small agency is getting squeezed out at this point. I'm not so sure. You know, I'm 41 years old, so um, you know, I'm going to probably be in the, in the business for another 20 years or so anyway. I'm not so sure that smaller books are going to be as viable in 20 years. So, you know, as far as numbers, you know, there's just so many economies of scale as you get bigger um, that small agencies kind of have to fight against. Now, there's other headaches that, that bigger agents have to deal with that, you know, smaller guys. Why do you think uh, why do you think smaller agencies are going to have a have a problem here in the coming years? Expand on that a little bit. I just think it's you know the 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 mar everybody thinks you know insurance agents are getting rich and our margins can be you know nice, but at the same time you know I think our carriers are putting more on us to do you know we're handling more of their work, their data entry, their you know that sort of thing. So that's expensive for for a small agency. Um, you know, I think once you get to a larger scale, most things, you know, even down to agency management, any of the things that you have to buy in your agency, if you can buy them at scale, you generally are going to be, you know, more profitable. And I just think that, you know, there's, there's some economies of scale in a lot of different aspects of, you know, the insurance business that make me want to grow. Uh, as opposed to stay in a smaller agent. I'm not saying you can't be small and, and be successful and, and all that, but I'm just trying to project out for 20 years from, from now for me. That's, that's what I have, have decided. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. So when you, obviously you grow scale, so you have, you started at scratch, right? I mean, when you were right. original, what would you say in your early marketing phase was your biggest driver when you were that small agency because i'll be frank i'm that's where i'm at and so as a person who wants who's interested in hearing how you get into where you are how did you what would be your best marketing plan i mean obviously landing pages and stuff now but back then maybe it was a little different yeah back then it was so different i mean i could put a you know one of the first i thought it was super cool when all of a sudden i put uh, pictures of some of my first clients in the local newspaper with me you know, saving them, you know, several hundred dollars a year. What, are, what is a newspaper? Can you yeah. <laughs> enlighten some people? <laughs> now, you know. I can't believe you'd cut down trees. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's totally different now. Quite honestly, it, you know, it would be tough to start scratch. I think it's harder now than it probably was even then. Well, thanks for making helping, me feel good. Yeah, you're not helping Adam out. Yeah. Adam, Adam, you just opened up your agency six months ago. Yeah, I think this, yeah. I think good segue. The whole reason we started this podcast, this was Adam's brainchild. Adam was a guy who said, "I'm six months into the business. Um, I want to know how to grow my agency, and I want to hear from other people." That's a pretty yeah. amazing story. This is entirely selfish. So I'm just sitting here asking <laughs> questions, trying to find out, trying to steal all your clients. No, I mean it, I think it's a fair question because I think the smaller agencies we we need to scale because you're exactly right. We, we have mouths to feed and, and going against their bigger guys like you. And so it's a it, fair questions, uh, but I think there's still some valid points to that. Even like getting pictures out with your clients and how you're saving the money that, that will turn some people your way. And it's pretty cost effective, even more cost effective now than maybe in your day. Right. Right. Uh -huh. and, and you know, there's other, there's, I'm sure there's things that guys like you and somebody else that's starting right out that, that, you know, you guys think of right away that, that I never would, you know, mm -hmm. so, you've got your own, you know, things that you could do that, you know, would, would 
I'm sure you do well if not better than my. Steve, my don't athlete. worry, man. I got my big boy pants on. You're not going to make me feel bad. I'm, I got into this open eyed, uh, eyes wide open. So, uh, yeah, no, that's. It's but now fair I will to say. say, you know, one thing that, that I feel like you probably have an advantage that I didn't is I didn't have a network like this. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. it, when I first started, it was, uh, you know, there were the agency associations, you know, your state associations and that sort of thing. But if you weren't actively involved there, you weren't really getting any advice from it from anybody else other than your carriers. And, you know, as much as I love my carriers and I think they generally have my best interest at heart, they've got their best interest at heart above anything else. So, you know, I think having a forum like this would have been so valuable, you know, starting out that, you know, I would have come up with, you know, three other ads to put in the newspaper instead of just <laughs> I was maybe you would have gotten a golf course or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you'd be able to close one of those sales. I'm just, just right. call me old fashioned. I don't know. Before uh, before we jump into the next uh, couple questions here uh, from Adam, if anybody here is watching and they have a question for Steve, please utilize the chat function. We want to get as much engagement as possible. Uh, I see Elliot Carr joined us just recently. Uh, so if if you're here and you're you have a question for Steve based on something he said or something you want to know more about what he's doing, please utilize the chat function now. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. Adam, go. Yeah, no, I think it bear, just one more thing before we jump on to questions. I think uh, Dave wants everyone to know there will be golf at Innovation 18. So <laughs> just, nice. I want to put that out there. So maybe you can get ahead of the game, Steve. Write them before we head out there. Yeah, I need to get my Arizona non-residence license. <laughs> I'm sure Dave's gunning for you anyway. We so. don't have enough Arizona agents in our group. So. <laughs> yeah, clearly can you, not. Can you please fill the void? <laughs> yeah, this group actually made me go to Arizona for vacation. And now my wife loves it. She keeps telling me, yeah, I can move to Arizona. You know, so. Sure. Of course she can. So, Steve, we got a really good question actually off the chat line. And, and, and G. Baker, and I apologize, Mr. Baker, I do not Graham. know the first name. Grant Baker. Yeah, I guess. Graham. Oh. Graham. I'm sorry? Graham. Okay, Graham Baker. I apologize, Graham. Graham uh, actually asked the question. He talks, from Canada. He to, he's from Canada? My goodness. Canada. Do we allow Canada. them even – do we allow people over the bridge, over the border in? Um, We're going to build a wall. Yeah. Firewall in this instance. So really quickly though, he wants to know kind of about how you mo- modified your approach. So when we started, you talked about putting things in the newspaper. Maybe you could talk about like the seasons of, of marketing change that you've 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 kind of used, right? So how it's evolved for you over time. Like so, it started with pictures, and now you got landing pages. <laughs> what happened in between that? Uh, you know, honestly, the, as far as landing pages are concerned, uh, you know, IAOA happened. You know, you start seeing kind of what other folks are doing. Um, you know, I do have to give Chris Langell, I know he gets a lot of love in the group, but I got to give him some more because he has really, you know, shown me a lot about, you know, how to really function, uh, with your website and that sort of thing. Got me into blogging, got me into doing some video and, and different things like that. So, um, a lot of that's just totally recent and I wish I could say there was a master plan in place, but you know, really I just steal what I see that works, you know, and if I'm doing something that works, I hope to God somebody else steals it and makes it work for them. You know, it's, uh, if I see something that works, I, I don't mind trying, you know, and, and that's, that's really what, what it has uh, taken over the years. It's just, all right, if I fall on my face and don't sell any uh, golf courses, we pick ourselves up and do the next thing, you know? Right. So. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's really cool. Um, so, if you gave it, so just kind of, we're, we're kind of working through a framework of questions and we t- asked you before about something you wish you knew before you had opened your agency, but would you, could you tell us one thing you wish you knew before you became an agent? So before you just started dealing with insurance. Wow. One thing that I wish I knew before Steve I became an insurance agent, man, yeah. it's been so long. I've been an insurance agent forever. Um, you know, the, one of the things that, that, I wish that I had had known earlier that, you know, we kind of alluded to was thinking of my agency as a business and thinking of myself as a business owner, as opposed to an insurance agent. Um, You know, you can be an insurance agent and you can be very successful, but if you're not, if you don't think of yourself as a person who runs a business that sells insurance, then you're kind of missing a lot of things that are out there, you know, a lot of moving parts. You can know the policy's cold. You can you know, do a great job for clients. You can be a good salesperson, but there's other moving parts in your business that, that you need to, to uh, you know, have an eye on. Uh, I've got a great uh, 
friend that's an accountant. He's actually doing all of my books now. Beginning of the year, I turned all of my bill pay, all of that stuff over to him. And I, I went to him uh, probably seven, eight years ago. And I said, look, I just need some basics on reporting QuickBooks, you know, show me what I need to be looking for in my numbers. You know, what would you be looking at? And just some, you know, real basics of business that, uh, you know, pro I didn't you know, properly uh, get when I was younger. So uh, maybe it took me a little longer to, to look for those sort of things to kind of get profitable and to run, run my agency as a business. Hmm. Well, that's awesome. Steve, I just want to say we're going to wrap this up here, but I just wanted to thank you so much for your time tonight. I know people's time in the evening uh, is precious. People have dinner and family and things to do. So thank you so much for taking a few moments here. Um, I hope everybody who's on the podcast has learned something. Uh, we're going to have this recording session posted on our website at iaoalliance.com uh, here probably in the next week or so. Uh, we're going to make Steve sound like James Earl Jones. We're going to make <laughs> <laughs> we're going to make Adam uh, look. Make uh, me a lot funnier. Yeah, we're going to make just add some hilarity to it. Yeah, or, we'll, like, we'll do our best. So yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, I'm Nicholas Ayers. He's Adam Zerinsky. <laughs> close right enough. There. Close enough. This has been an IAOA collab cast. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We are out.